Right. Uh, good morning. Um, welcome to Friday morning at 44Con. Uh, I'm Steve Armstrong. Uh, for the next um, period of time, I'm going to talk about um, incident handling mistakes. Uh, looking at it from the uh, management and trying to stop you making nude, uh, not nude, uh, noob, that was last night, uh, noob uh, incident handling mistakes. A uh, little bit about me so you know where I'm, why I'm talking to you and, and what my background is. I'm ex-Air Force. I spent uh, 18 years in the RAF uh, helping them build secure systems, accrediting them, penetration testing them, um, and running various aspects. After I left the Air Force, I went and set up a uh, security consultancy, and we worked for people in the military, we worked for defense contractors, we worked for a little bit of government, we also worked for gaming companies um, and music companies, which is kind of extremes, sort of like complete government lockdown sort of environment, or you get the other one, which is the music industry, which is very relaxed, very sort of like, don't encrypt our stuff, we don't like encryption, things like that. Um, I've been doing incident response for over eight years, and throughout that, when you're working with some of the biggest game companies in the world, you tend to find that Russian hackers love to try and get credit card details, user accounts, passwords, etc. So they're quite a big target. Um, so we spent a lot of time doing incident response right down at the, both at the sort of wide international, you know, large dispersed networks, and also uh, trying to find, fight people off desktops, trying to fight people out of databases, etc. The likes of the APT1 were all over um, the likes of some of our customers, um, and all of their URLs, et cetera, featured in all of the reports. And I'm also a SANS instructor, so if you're ever doing SANS cor courses and conferences, you'll probably see me hanging around the SANS environment. And I'm also one of the guys who helped design and come up with the concept for Cyber CPR, which is a product that we are sort of releasing later on uh, today in beta um, that's free out for or, uh, small organizations. Right, enough of the corporate stuff. Okay, end of corporate mode. Welcome to the morning after. Uh, okay. Um, I thought of doing like a really big white screen type stuff, but some of you are just going to be like awful. Some of you are probably having flashbacks from last night. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about actually what instant response is, because a lot of people have a misconception about actually what it is and what it's about. I'm going to talk about our issues with management, because a lot of this problem comes down to management, and then I'll talk about my, my problem with people, because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm okay with some people, but other people I'm just not happy with. Then we'll talk about um, some of the fundamental IR problems. Some of these will be easy uh, for you to pick up, but some of them you'll see will actually trace back to the people problem and to the management problem. I'm not saying that management is the root cause of all evil, but we'll see how this goes. Um, I might get a chance to get a demo working, and then at the end, if there's any time left, and I haven't been zapped by the, by the uh, gun, oh, um, we'll do some organized heckling in the form of some sort of questions and baiting, etc. Right. What is instant response? Why do we care? Instant response is like the new, it's, you know, right, nice trendy sort of word these days. It's picked up from cyber. Um, those of you who know me and know the fact that I'm an, I'm an old fart will know the fact that, you know, I was in cyber before it was called cyber. You know, cyber was just some sort of cliche sort of word. It still is, but we were there before it was invented. Um, why are we an instant response and why we care, actually? Because if you look at uh, these facts are taken from the PwC uh, UK Biz survey from this year. And then look at the number of organizations that have been compromised. And this is one of the driving factors behind people wanting to be in instant response and deal with instant response. You know, it's over 81% of large organizations have had a breach. Wow. 60% of small businesses. Okay? If you look at actually the number of breaches, okay, six for a small business, 16 for a large business. That's a, that's a, you know, that's a sizable amount. When you look at the actual cost per breach, it gets scary. Okay? 1.15 million for a large organization. Some of those can take that kind of hit. Small organizations, less than 250 employees, at 115,000, that's a major hit on their bottom line. That's like two staff, four staff of your manufacturing company. That's the kind of cost that you're looking at. Now I talk about what, what is it? What is instant response? A lot of people say, oh, instant response is like this, it's like this chess game. It's you versus the other people. And you go, no, 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 it's not, it's not. Because chess has rules. Chess has a board. I have pieces, you have pieces. We, we say three o'clock, let's play chess. We arrange it, we have tea, or in, we're English, we have tea. We play chess. That's fine. But <laughs> I'm a consultant. I'm playing on somebody else's network. You know, my chess board is your network. That makes me uncomfortable. The fact is as well is, you know, everybody's network's different. And I don't know which network we're playing on. 
the attacker gets to choose the board. He gets to choose the time of day. He doesn't phone me up and say, Steve, let's play, let's play chess. He phones me up by quite happily compromising one of my customers at three o'clock on a Saturday morning. My customer phones me up and says, Steve, let's play chess. I'm like, oh, Saturday. It's like, so that's the problem. I also, the fact is that you don't get the textbook network. And anybody who's worked in IR, who knows that when you arrive and you say, have you got the, uh, have you got NetFlow? And they go, Net who? NetFlow. No. Have you got an IDS? No. Have you got logs? Mm, some. You're playing with a non-standard network. You've got to try and work out what they have first. The other thing is, the bad guy's got way more play pieces. You're just, you're fighting an endless battle. They've got the time, the resources. You're limited by the time and effort that your customer or your organization can afford you to spend on the incident. It's an unfair advantage. You don't even know where they are. You ever try playing chess when you don't know where the other player's pieces are? How can you plan your strategy? How can you deal with this thing? The only time you know that the game has started is when they start knocking over your servers. They started compromising your network. You started losing pieces on your board. Okay. And the problem is you're looking at the fact that your systems have gone down, but it might take you days or weeks to work out the fact that actually you've lost data. What have you lost? Where has it gone? So saying that instant response is like a game of chess? No. One thing I'm going to focus on is this concept here, this um, OODA loop. And those of you who are ex-military will look not then go, oh, OODA loop. OODA loop is this concept um, put together by um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, John Boyd. Um, and it was quite fundamental to US military thinking. It's this concept that you, in any attack situation, and if you're in sort of, you know, instant response, you're fighting an attacker. And the concept is that you must always observe what's happening. You know, and that means you need some sort of indicator as to what's changed on the network or what's happening on the network. You need to then orientate yourself to what the attacker is trying to achieve. You need to understand what his capabilities are, what his goal is. Because once you understand that, then you can actually decide what you're going to do. And once you've decided, you can then act. For those of you who are into your military hardware, this is why the F-16 and the F-18 look nothing like the F-14 and the F-15. Big, heavy fighters that the Americans used to have, they decided that faster and nimbler was better. And that's why if you have a OODA loop, as we call it, if you have an OODA loop that is faster and tighter than that of your opponent, you can outmaneuver them. It's a whole concept of maneuverability. In uh, military speak, we talk about the, uh, the person with the tightest OODA loop has a higher operational tempo. They're working faster than you. They can outthink you. They can do whatever they wish because they can outthink, outplan, and outact what you're trying to do. This guy, Chuck. Chuck Norris is 74 years old. People are going, yeah, but he's yeah, slow. Old people, old people are slow. Who would like to fight Chuck? Why not? He's old. He's slow. Because he's actually still able to see what you're doing. Chuck Norris is experienced in martial arts, so he can actually anticipate what you're going to do. He can still decide based upon his huge experience in martial arts as to what to do. So yes, he might be a couple of milliseconds slower, but he's still got a tighter OODA loop than you have. Let's talk about management. I love management. The problem with management and instant response is, management have a very black and white view on things. You go on an instant response course, you must know about instant response. You know it, you've been on a course. Because for some reason, in six or day, days or five days or however long you spend on a course, somebody can inject you with 20 years of experience. Somehow, I don't know how it happens. Uh, I know I've been on some courses where there is some kind of injection, but it's not necessarily of experience. Then they have this, this assumption that actually everything that happens on TV is real, okay, which is awful. It doesn't take this long on television. Of course it doesn't. It's only 50 minutes long. Your programs are 50 minutes. Okay? Then they look at how much are we paying him? Okay, how much are we paying these guys? What would Sherlock do? You know? We've got these urgent, urgent priorities. We need you to work on all of these priorities because they're all urgent. These are all the highest priority, all six of them. How does that work? 
classic one. But we bought them the best tools. Why, why can't you do this job? You've got the best tools. CSI wasn't this slow. The problem I say is with management, it's not the people. It's not just the people. It's actually part of what the good management provides you capability. It enables your staff. Bad management leaves people in disarray. So all they end up doing is clicking around the tools. Tools do not equal capability. And when you're out there, I'm not that I'm against vendors. Anybody who says this, this magic box will do all anti-APT kind of stuff, just plug it in your network, switch it on, pay us the 100,000 pounds, and it'll all be great. That does not equal capability. That just means you've spent 100,000 pounds, okay? And I, I love, I'm back to my martial arts thing. Um, I've been doing Taekwondo now for, oh crikey, 30 plus years. Um, and I love teaching new people martial arts. Because new people who come to any sort of martial arts class, in their head, they are Bruce Lee. There are only three lessons in, but they're, they're in their head, they are Bruce Lee. And therefore, when they start to uh, actually try and do anything, they try and take the basic tools you, you've given them, and they try and, in their head, they can do anything. This is a beautiful set of walnut-handled chisels. You can buy these from B&Q, they're about 85 pounds. They're beautiful. You give the person the best tools that they can. You say, I need you to do this instant response. I need you to build me this tool. Build me this network. Secure this environment. And the guy comes up with this. You go, you didn't quite get it. What, we gave you the best tools. What was the problem? He doesn't have the experience. He doesn't have the techniques. The problem in our industry is, what's the difference between a guy who's got 20 years of experience and a guy who's just at a university who's done two or three courses? They both pitch up with the same laptop. They both pitch up with the same tools. In interview, they both talk the same kind of language. And then you get the old guy in the network, and he rolls up his sleeves and gets on with it. And then you guy comes in and goes, ooh, no, um, I can't get my tool to install. Um, I'm kind of stuck. And it's always depressing if you speak to anybody who's doing any recruitment in our industry. It's depressing about how new people in the industry think that just by trotting off tool names gets you a job that demands 45, 50,000 pounds. Even when it comes to actually using the tools, they have no idea. Actual capability. Like I say, my, my kid's doing Taekwondo. I love the fact that when you take a new guy who's just out of university, he sits there and he gets the tool, he fires the tool up and he clicks around the same buttons that he thought he saw on the course. He sits there and in his head he is Bruce Lee on that tool and the expert sitting back there going, dude, you're just not getting it at all. Maybe the tool breaks, okay? I love these guys. But in their head, they are both Bruce Lee. They are, they are kicking to the head, they are punching so fast. And this is the problem that we have. People will oversell their skills. They will oversell their capabilities. I love that one. Back kick. And that's the problem that we face in the industry. And management don't recognize that, and they don't help us by giving us some of the better tools, the better people, et cetera, the better skills. So that's a problem we have to face. As I've said to you, TV doesn't represent real life, okay? 55 minutes or 50 minutes of CSI gets you two investigations, a well-equipped team that can reverse engineer based upon one single pixel image, a whole investigation, okay? And that is what our bosses think happens. But most of our teams, they're not even like this. The boss thinks, I bought the tool. I spent half a million on tools. You've got the right. Surely we've got a CSI team. You go, no, we're more like this. Now, I like, I like Scooby-Doo, uh, showing my age. Let's look at the Misty Machines team composition. Okay, what have we got? We've got Velma. Hey, you know, Velma, she is the guru. She's the one who sorts everything out. What we do, we do without Velma? Then we have, I think, Fred and Daphne, they are management. Uh, they smile way too much. They don't actually add anything other than a little bit of decoration to the whole episode. And then we have the comedy duo, Shaggy and Scooby. How many of you have just mapped your whole team into these five people? How many Velmas have you got? How many Shaggy and Scoobies have you got? It's kind of bad, isn't it? Now, instant response is a new thing. Cyber is a new thing. Let's go back to the original APT, Sun Tzu. What did he have to say about IR? We asked him in a, in a, in a webcast we had last week. And he said, 
if you know, you know your enemy, you know yourself, hey, great. You know your tools, you know your team, you can work well. You're a mature incident response team. Okay? If you know yourself, hey, you know, we've got the best tools, we're well skilled, but we have no intelligence, we have no idea what the enemy's doing. Hey, you're sort of developing. If you haven't got a, if you haven't got, you know, if you've got a team full of shaggies, and that means you haven't got a Scooby, then you're gonna lose every time. And the worst thing is, you won't even know that you're losing, because you'll be the four-year-old doing the martial arts, doing the moves, and the only person who's standing watching you fail is the attacker. How about? So it's not about management, it's not just about management, it's actually about the whole process. Management enables you and gives you the right tools to be able to do the right job. If you understand what your goal is and understand what your attacker's goal is, you can actually do a good job. You need to understand who your attackers are. Who is attacking you? Why? Have you ever done the analysis? Why is it important? Well, the boss will turn around and say, oh, you know, I don't care. Why don't I care who attacks us? You know? Then we have, let's ask Bella. Tell me what do you think? Little zowie moment, she goes, well, you know, if you don't understand the attacker, how are you gonna try and outmaneuver somebody? The second O is orientate. If I know that I will have a good suspicion that it's a denial of service because some, ha some hacked off kid is annoyed because we suspended his account, I know the kind of mitigations that we can do. If I think, hang on, this is an APT, this is a targeted phishing attack that's trying to install malware, then I can take different steps by simply understanding exactly what's happening. If you don't do this, then how can you actually try an outmover? That's why people selling threat intelligence are doing such a good job. Let's think about the kind of people we have, very briefly. The first group, my favorite group, shits and giggles. Why do you do that? Why not? You know, you want to hang out in 4chan? Yeah, go and have a look at them. They were like, let's have some fun. Okay, those guys, they're not going to do any permanent damage. They might hit your reputation. Then we have our hacktivisms, you know, our anonymous people who are taking up a cause or type thing. They're going to have a different tool set, a different plan. Okay, then we have our cyber criminals. You know, and cyber criminals are in there for multiple reasons. You know, the old Sabu there was, he was just trying to pay, make, pay his rent. That's all he was like, I just pay my rent. That's all I want to do. Then you end up with like track two. Stole an estimated $2 million, uh, $2 million 140,000 credit cards with an organized infrastructure to sell credit card details. He was in it for the money. Kind of cool. Then we are a big threat, cyber espionage. People are after competitive intelligence and to get access to your secrets. You look at the tool sets. Your Giggle Screws, what are they after? You know, a bit of DOS, a bit of command injection, SQL injection. I don't really want to overly penetrate your network because there's a chance based upon historic that I might actually go to jail. Okay, so they're brave, but they're not stupid, all of them. Not all of them. Okay, so they're gonna try and do some, you know, denial of service kind of stuff, sort of interruption to get a bit of press, get a bit of reputational stuff, but nothing too jail timey. Your cyber criminal is he's looking for a little bit more persistence, a little bit of covert stuff, okay? Browsers, droppers, malware, trying to hide what he's doing. Your cyber espionage, well, it doesn't matter really what they're, what they're trying to achieve. They're still going to use the same kind of tools. Rootkits, stolen credit card, or not stolen credit card, stolen uh, certificates, code signing certificates to enable them to go covert. So if you understand the kind of, even in the early stages of an incident, the early indications as to what the tool is, where it's been targeted against, and take an overarching view of that, you can actually start and understand the kind of attacker group that you're after. And therefore you can start to observe, orientate, and make a decision. Going into the sort of the basics then of the, of the sort of, uh, a lot of places quote the uh, six stages, we sort of amended it slightly and put an extra stage in there. Because the six stages of instant response was actually designed at a time when cloud, putting your data on somebody else's network, wasn't really a thing. Now it's commonplace. So as well as our sort of standard six stages, we have this assessment and engagement, actually understanding where is our data. And it's quite surprising when you go into some organizations to say to them, so where is this box? And they're like, oh, it's in our um, outsourced data center. And where's that? Uh, not overly sure. Which country is it in? I'll get back to you. So it's interesting to get that involved. But let's look at some of the stages. First one is a classic one. Not having an instant response plan. Several people have highlighted this. What do you do if you haven't got a plan? You just wing it. You let Shaggy and Scooby go and run around and get chased by mummy. 
That's what your whole instant response plan comes down. Or you end up with this horrible one. You end up with this, this tomb of, of paper that nobody reads. And the only person that actually looks at it is the author, the guy who quality checked it, maybe your auditor, and the defense counsel who say that you didn't actually follow the policy and the process because you didn't actually read the document. You didn't actually follow what it says you must do. So having overly, overly complicated large documents is, is not a great idea. Things like asset registers, basics, no, having, no build station information, no server build station. And this comes back to another management thing. If you go to the network administrators and their, their execs and you know, the C-level network guy and go, I'm looking for a network diagram, and he goes, we haven't got one. How can you manage what you can't measure? How can you be in charge of anything if you haven't actually got an understanding of what you've got? We went and did uh, some uh, IR work for an organization, and uh, their head of IT security came out. And we were talking to him, and I said, can I get a, like a network diagram? He's like, hmm. He said, I could draw one for you. I said, okay, well, there's a whiteboard, go draw. So after five minutes, he, he goes away, comes back in with a, with a piece of paper, and he starts drawing this network diagram. And I sort of looked over his shoulder and looked at the network diagram that he had. It was actually a picture of the same whiteboard that he was currently writing on. I was like, where did you get the picture from? He said, well, I'm only in the job three months. When I left, I asked for a network, or when I arrived, I asked for a network diagram too. And this is what my predecessor gave me. He drew a network diagram. I was like, dude, you've been in job three months and you haven't actually got an idea of what's on your network? I'm like, yeah, but I'm getting around to it. I like, how can you actually manage that? How can you actually understand what you've got? The other one is documents. I mean, we all love to read detailed documents, don't we? And we all love, I mean, the kind of document we want has like loads of information, really easy to read. We don't write those, we're in IT. Why use one word when 600 will do, okay? And then who likes writing them? When your boss says, you need you to document all the security policies in the system. It's just not what you want to do. So, knowledge transfer is, is like only by experience. And if you haven't got anything written down, what do you have left? Well, you have tribal knowledge. You ask the guy who built it. You ask the guy who's been there for three months, longer than you have, who's been there for four years. You say, dude, what's wrong with this? He says, oh, well, when I arrived, we had this, this strange method of building servers. And I think this is one of these servers that we built strange. But always going to the tribal leader is always a weird sort of experience because they're like, pay homage to my power and knowledge. You have to always bow down to the person who's got that. He says, I am the only person who knows that I am the most valuable person in the organization. So people don't like to share. Other things we have is identification, is, is if you don't understand what your network is, how do you know when it's changed? Basics comes back to preparation and management. I've, we, we've seen um, incidents where the attackers promoted another domain controller. Why compromise one when you can make your own? You know, the guys are going there, oh, look, we've got 27 domain controllers. Oh, I am, we're supposed to have 26. Where did this one come from? They had no concept, okay? Um, and the problem is with this is you end up doing a lot of forensic spinning of your wheels because you end up analyzing systems that you thought were actually compromised when they weren't, but you know standard build documents. You have no standard basics. Have you got a complete hash of all of the files that are in a standard build for your environment. How long does that take to make? An hour? How much time will it save you in investigation? A week? That's an easy thing. And update it every time Microsoft puts out patches and every time you change things, hash every file, dead easy. Because if you have a poor identification of an incident, you go, yeah, that's fine, a false negative. APTs love that. They want you to be in false negative land. They want you to miss everything that they've done because you're either overworked you don't have the information, or you make a bad decision. Remember this, this is another management fail. Trusting the guy who's just arrived to have the best knowledge. Oh yeah, you wanna see the CV he's got, you wanna see the write-up that his previous organization gave him. You're going, we've just taken another Scooby on, haven't we? Because he hasn't got a Scooby. Because he's sitting on night shifts there and he's just accepting what he has, and therefore you end up with a false negative based upon somebody you have never tested. Have you ever tested your new incident handlers? Take an old incident, throw some data, I'm saying, what do you think of that? Okay, 
good thing to do. So you actually understand the capabilities, because otherwise you end up with people just going, yeah, yeah, sure, you know. SMB going over HTTP, that's fine. Why, why would that be bad? Other stuff we have is assessment, okay? Not understanding where your IT is, who are you gonna call? You know, when the, when the system goes down, who do you phone? Do you have the speed dial for Rackspace? Do you know who to speak to? Have you ever actually spoken to them in the flesh? Actually know some sort of contact over there? If, you, if it involves credit card information or PII, do you, do you, do you, did you tell legal? Do you tell legal where the system is, where the server is? Do you actually understand what's there? Classic ones in containment. Well, you know, if you've no build document, you've no network diagram, how do you actually know where the attacker might be? How you know if you don't know the fact that you have six servers that all have exactly the same kernel level exploit, but actually you've got another 4,000 of those as well. If you don't know that, that changes your whole perspective of how fast to do containment, how fast to move through an environment. Other things within your, uh, within your organization, does your instant response team, do they sit on the network? Do they actually sit in the domain? Do you actually have your, I mean, this is quite a common environment. You have, an organization says, yeah, our domain administrators have been heavily targeted. Many of them have been compromised in the last year. You look at the incident response team, and you go, guys, you're all on, on the domain. They're like, yeah, well, we have to be, it's part of corporate policy. Like, so you're on the domain that's been targeted by the attackers, and they had domain admin. Yeah, do you not see a problem with that? Integrity, integrity of your data. It's an easy way for an attacker to monitor exactly what you're doing by simply watching what changes on your system. You know, those of you who play with Windows and things like this, look at the default C dollar share, straight on the network, just copy your emails, copy the PST file. It's very easy to do. And then we look at the cleaning up. You know, the attacker comes along, finds old exploit code. We actually spent um, about three weeks doing an incident. It was a nice sort of incident, it was, it was, it was good fun. Um, in a sort of masochistic kind of way. But as we were going through, we found you know, uh, C99 PHP, you know, basically shell code, nice little shell code in there. I was like, oh, look at this, we found this. Maybe the attackers use this. Spoke to the uh, local admins, and we found this uh, PHP shell code on here. They're like, oh yeah, that's from there from last time. Excuse me? Yeah, last time. What do you mean? Well, yeah, well, we had a, we had a compromise, um, and we found this, and we thought we'd, well, we thought we should keep it, but we didn't know where to put it. So we just moved into a different directory. It's like, so you left it on the web server. You left it accessible. And the attacker just basically stepped through all of this, looked through all the other directories. Did they move it? Oh, yes, they did. And he was able to pull it down. You know? So the shell code was there when I got there. It makes it easy for an organization. But also, things like restoring, a, you know, when you're doing the recovery stage and you're restoring a previously vulnerable version or a previously compromised version. Okay? If you look at the Mandian's reports, they were talking about in 2000. And 12, that the average time between a system being compromised and it being detected was 416 days. How far back do your backups go? 30 days? 60 days? Are you just restoring a previous version of the compromised system? It's quite common. This is so common. People say, oh, I've got, I've got malware on my laptop, and the IT department say, bring it in. We'll flatten it. We'll give it back to you. And that's all they do. They flatten it and give it back to you in an unpatched state. I've seen people going in with, you know, up-to-date laptops and coming back with laptops that are six months out of date, missing, you know, 100 Windows patches, thinking, you're making the problem worse, not better. Okay, and that's a basic thing you can do. Other things we've got is uh, afterwards, after you actually have an incident, do you actually go back and look through? Some people call this, call this lessons identified. I don't, because if you're doing it for the third time, you haven't, you haven't learned anything, you know? We say it's all about reviewing what you've done, see if you can improve. You know, as Karl Marx says, if you, you know, once is bad, twice is getting into farce. If you get hit by the same people with the same malware and you're not tracking it, monitoring it, then it's getting ridiculous. How do you defend your tempo? How do you defend what you've got? Good people, good management, and not just of the team, but actually of the network giving you the right information so you can actually detect and understand what's actually out there. You know what's on the network. You know what should be on the network. But once you're in there, how do you talk? How do you actually plan an incident? The amount of times we get introduced to an incident because the customer 
emails you a really big email. It goes like hundreds of you know, threads long. And you're thinking, wow, that's, that's your whole incident. You know? And at the top, they might have put in sort of, you know, client sensitive. That's their only mitigation. Because the whole incident is played out in this one email. It's sent about 50 or 60 people on distribution groups. And you're thinking, wow, this is how we're actually communicating. We've received emails from clients saying, we think an attacker's compromised our email server. Thinking, do you think? Do you think he knows that you know he's there? Do you think he's reading your email? Oh, never thought of that. So think about how you communicate. If you're a UK company, Skype, American owned. Google Apps, American owned. Do you know that you're pushing your instant handling information over to the US? Making it open to all US investigation type stuff. Okay, how do you communicate? Face chat, FaceTime, anything. How do you manage it? How do you actually manage what you're doing? Do you do the classic? Windows, operating system, Microsoft Office, and Excel. Who's still managing instance with Excel? Yeah, you know you want to put your hand up, yeah. It's, I can understand it, you know, all your information's there, but is that seriously as good as we get? In this day and age of APTs, when they're using, you know, stolen code signing certificates, they're using DLL, you know, uh, uh, ramming of, of other malicious files into signed uh, executables, and we're fighting them with Wireshark and Excel. But we've got the best people, you know? They know exactly what they're doing. In their heads, they are Bruce Lee. So it's interesting when we talk about people, actually, you know, how you communicate these things. You know, and I've seen people using a variety of different tools. They're out there making up various boards and stuff. So we've, we've been working in IR for a long time, and we decided that actually that was a bit of a, that was a, bit of a pain. So we came up with our own idea. We came up with our own little, we call it like a, a cyber crisis planning room. It's sort of taken from the American concept of, you know, when they have a, what's it they call it, a house breach, I think, or a burglar. Um, they have this strong room in the middle of the house where they can go and hide there until the law enforcement comes. So you come up with this, this cyber crisis planning room where you actually go and talk and communicate and share files in a safe place. It's not on the domain. There will never be a single sign-on option for it. It's separate username, separate authentication. Okay, um, as we are UK based and um, we're all SC cleared, we got SC cleared developers. So it's not coded in India. Not that I have anything against Indian developers, but I like things to be coded in the UK. You know, British company, I like British people. Let's get British people jobs. Okay, we've got a beta version out today. Um, and the nice thing is, because uh, those people who know me, um, we run a small shop and I know how expensive good tools can be. So it will always be free if you've got three users or less. You too can have your own instant management little, you know, little portal that we have. I'll show you a demo uh, shortly. And you have the ability to install this either on a cloud, if you want to put your data on somebody else's server. You can do it locally. But we're actually planning. You can put on like these, little mini computers that you can take around as a consultant. Okay? That's an i7 processor in a small box, 16 gigs of memory. And these things fly. And this will quite happily manage your whole incident in a method that you can actually just shove in your rucksack and go to the customer. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do. Make it nice and small and easy and light. What does it do? Well, initially we came up with this idea about, well, we just want someone to put some data. Because if you've ever done IR and you've done IR on a fast network, you ask an admin for a packet capture. And he goes, cool, yeah, I'll run your packet capture. All right, I've got this uh, eight gig packet capture. Um, how do you want me to get it to you? You're like, ah. Right, where are you? Oh, I'm in, uh, I'm in uh, Washington, D.C. Hmm, I'm in U.K. So what do we use, Dropbox? We can't email it, although I've seen people try. What do you do? So we have this, this concept of this ability for everybody who's involved in incidents to actually be able to log in and upload files and store them centrally. Now, when legal get involved, they all say, yeah, but, but where's the data? The data's in the database. Okay? We keep the data in the database. We encrypt every file that we get. We hash every file that we get. So the moment that you send it, you can also do a quick local SHA-256, check the signature, check it against what's been uploaded and received, and then say, yeah, what I sent has been received. You've got the best evidence, and you've got one copy of it. And anybody else who's got access to the incident can then actually download that file and work on it. And if they need to change it, modify it, they can do so. 
and they could upload their results, their derived evidence, the initial evidence. We thought it would be kind of cool. We also have the ability to, at the moment, little ability to, you know, look things up against virus total if you have it connected to the internet. We allow you to extract the strings of a file. This is done automatically, okay, which is nice because, you know, you can run this on a tablet. Not the whole thing, but it's a web interface. So you can be standing there, you know, doing some support to your client in Costa, looking at the strings of a log file that he's uploaded. You're doing it on a tablet because you've actually got the same access to the same infrastructure and access into the device. Okay? Does they have a nice ability to pull out from PCAP? You said a PCAP. Actually, what's the first things people do when you give them a PCAP? Let me just fire out Wireshark. Yeah. What are you going to look for? Stuff. What kind of stuff? Mm hmm. I know. I'll, I'll put it through Snort. Well, why don't you have it actually that the moment you give it to the tool, it says, why don't I put it through Snort? Why don't I actually, as soon as you give it to me, I'll put it through Snort, I'll pull out the IP addresses, I'll pull out all the DNS information, and I'll give it to you in an interface. Because why should you have to do that? Why should you have to go through all this, this pain? Let me just see if I can run this, if this is going to work. I, I have this bad reputation with demos because they just always fail. Right. Boop. Let me see. No, 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 no. Yeah, that's looking good already. Where's that going? Right. Boop, boop. We also, within this, we separate out incidents because we all know that you don't want every incident handler knowing everything that's happening, okay? Here I have two users, okay? This is a, because of the screen resolution, I'm having to, to narrow this down. Normally, this would be, if, I, if we know this will let you, this would be a nice big display with lots of other bits of information on it, okay? But at the moment, I'm on 1024-768, which is like back in the 80s. Um, so it's a sort of kind of reduced display. But this is actually the kind of view you would get if you're running it on an iPad or a Nexus tablet. So it's going quite well. Okay, so here I have a, a general user um, who's got access to his little dashboard, and here I have an administrator who has an admin dashboard. We separated out users from incidents. So I can be an admin on this system, and I could be looking at a particular incident, say this one down here. I can say, oh, I want to see this incident here, this test incident. Even though I'm an application admin, I don't have any rights to it. Because you sometimes, sometimes don't trust the admins. Sometimes the admins go bad. So sometimes you need to keep things away from them. And it's easier to do it in a standard process. So I have a couple of users, and in my, in my little interface here, it's quite nice and easy to see. I've got a quick, how many instances have I got? A couple of mediums, a low. How much activity's happened over the last couple of hours? How much activity's happened over the last couple of days? Nice and easy. If I go into any one of my uh, incidents, say I'll go into this one here, okay? I've got my, uh, my, I've got a little alert up there, it's popped up recently. I've got the ability to look at what's actually happened. I've got the ability to see who's access. You know, I've got access to this. Bob's got access to this. As you can see over here, Bob. Bob, you got access? Yeah. Bob's got access to this system. Bob, I don't think you should really have access to this system. I think I should take your access away. When Bob goes, oh, but, but I need to be able to see, oh. Instant, no access. But the beautiful thing is, and you might have seen this on some systems, where you give somebody access and they go and pull down a load of files, and then you go, but what did he access? Did Bob download all that stuff that we didn't want him to? Well, I can actually see what actually happened in my timeline as to when it was started, automatically generated. Who generated the alert, or who generated the, uh, added the various entities to the system, who got added to the incident, time stamped. Okay, we put them on, then we took them off. Then we put them on again. Then we added some more information. Then we added some comments. What did Bob say? Bob said he's gonna have a look at the server. Excellent. What did I say? Cool. Can you run me a packet capture? Bob said, yeah. I added some more servers. Oh, look, Bob uploaded a packet capture. Thanks, Bob. Okay, then I added Ed, because Ed's gonna give me a, hand, a bit of a hand. Then we added some more information, so I can see this. Very dynamically, automatically generated. I can look at that information. Here's my various servers that were uploaded or um, added into the system, okay? Variety of different systems. I've got my packet capture. I think that looks kind of cool. What have I got? Well, just look at it. In the background now, it's gonna go and parse that file. The first time, it'll take a couple of seconds because I don't parse everything every time. There we go. So I've got looking at the IP addresses. I can quietly skim around. I can look at the alerts. Ooh. Slightly reduced screen size, but you can see that quite clearly. And how easy is that? 
to be able to look at the number of external IP addresses, where they've come from, index them, kind of easy stuff to make your job better. And we said, we're only in beta. This is kind of cool. Let me go back. Let me go back to my incident. We've also, say, got the ability if we take, um, maybe I'll upload a, um, what else have I got? Oh, I've got a text document. Okay, text documents are quite nice. We convert them to PDFs to make them safe, because if you're uploading shell code. We also have the ability to search it dynamically. I can do that on an iPad. I think I can be standing there in Costa. Let me just have a look. Oh, excellent. I'm doing work for you all the time. And that's nice, because I don't have to start opening things up. I don't have to start moving things around. It's kind of cool. What else have I got there? I've got, uh, I've got pictures, I've got view pictures, yeah. Nice and easy. Everything is shared. Every single thing gets uploaded, okay? Uploading stuff is quite easy. Let me just bring this across slightly. Doo, 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 doo. Uh, go back up here. Let me add a piece of evidence. Doo, doo, doo. Select a file from my desktop. Let me just put this up a little bit of that. Nice and easy. What do I call it? Ooh, strange. File. It's as easy as that. Go down to my evidence. There's my file. There's my hash. Is it on virus total? Yes. Nice. OK. We're also looking at integrating um, some of the other malware databases. So we actually have a local malware database that will actually automatically do it. And we're also moving towards fuzzy hashing so that we can actually look at comparisons between systems. OK. So that's. A nice, easy to use interface. We've got a workshop on this um, at 2 o'clock today, so please do come along and have a look and see what you think of it and give us some feedback. The next things we have, if I flick back into my presentation, next stuff that we have in the next uh, couple of months, we're going to start and take all of the information that you've uploaded into it. We're going to actually index it and start cross checking it. Because we want to get away from tribal knowledge. Because when your incident handlers leave, you've lost all of that information about what they found. That you, and I've seen it so many times when you go back into an organization after two years and they go, we've got this attacker, he's coming from this IP address, and you go, isn't it sad when you recognize IP addresses? And, it's, and you're like, I know, I know that. I almost know the AS number for that. Okay? But why should you have to do that when the system can do it automatically? So in the background, we're going to take clues, we're going to look at IP addresses, ASN numbers, we're going to look at DNS, we're going to look at passwords, usernames, and things that were used in the incident. We're going to pull them together and talk, call it a campaign. So therefore, you can link possible incidents together to see whether or not it's the same attackers. We're going to put in workflows, because what do you guys actually do when you say, go do deep dive forensics? What does he do? Apart from he goes, see you in two weeks, boss. What stages does he go through? How do you standardize that? If you get to give it to Felma, does she like go, oh, this is going to be great, and she comes out with great stuff? Or does Shaggy sit there and go, mm hmm? What do you get out of it? Let's actually have a defined workflow that says, here's what you should do. Here's the steps that you should do. And actually, if you have a workflow that the user says, I have done this stage, I have done this stage, and the system automatically feeds it back to the incident manager, well, now you have visibility of team workload. You've got management ability. You've got the ability to go, oh, look, Felman's got like 600 weeks of work to do, and Shaggy's got none. You know, do we need to rechain, retrain Shaggy? Do we need to move some of the work across? Do I need to move some of the low priority stuff across? CPR, we have priorities of incidents. Nothing like 75 different layers, high, medium, low. Because that's, that's, that's three fingers. I can work with that. Execs, they can work with that. Give them too many levels and they get, they get confused. Other things we do, um, we're going to bring in virtual machine support because you get a piece of malware. What's the first thing you want to do? Stick it in a machine, do you? Well, why should I have to do that? Why should I go, oh, let me just spin up a virtual machine? How wouldn't it be cool if you just went, do you see that suspect file? Why don't you spin me a virtual machine? Why don't you get the machine to actually build you a virtual machine and say, what kind of networking do you want? Do you want to connect to the internet? No, 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 isolated only. Cool. Put that on a virtual machine, build it, send me the login when it's ready. And then when you're finished with it, you go destroy. But before it does that, it says, do you have any good evidence that you've now derived from this? And you go, yeah, well, put it in this folder, this little upload folder, and I'll automatically put it back into the incident. <gasps> you've now got traceability. You've now got derived evidence. You're like, oh, this is kind of cool. And it's not on the analyst's laptop. It's centralized. It's indexed. It's, 
We're now building an actual corpus body of information about people who attack you. And it's archived and it's there. And once it's in CPR, you can't delete it. You can hide it, but you can't delete it. Finally, we're going to bring in a better GUI because the GUI is a bit clunky at the moment. It's, it's, it's OK because we're in beta. It's to show you the back end functionality. The fact is that this system encrypts every file. The fact that we have separate authentication, we have authentication logs, we have the full tracking. We've built a whole environment from the ground with SC Clear developers. We're giving it to you free. The new GUI is going to have better alerting. It's going to have the ability to do background tasks because if you're uploading a five gigabyte PCAP, you don't want to be sitting there looking at a web browser going, You'll be doing other things, okay? So bringing in that kind of capability, and that's all coming in the next uh, six to eight months, depending on how the workload goes. So there we go. How am I doing for time? Uh, not too bad, actually. Um, I think I've covered most of the bits and pieces. The the, the noob stuff, as I was, as a sort of headline to talk about. I think you see now it's not the obvious silly mistakes are not actually the analyst problem. It's actually management giving them the right tools and understanding the whole problem themselves. I include Chuck Norris. You always have to get a Sun Tzu quote in there. Um, a bit of Simpson stuff, Ghostbusters. I think that's definitely achievement unlocked. If you want to get hold of any of us, there's the details, but come to the workshop. But coming back to this, who is the best person to be? And I'll throw this into you. Go back and watch any episode of Hanna-Barbera's Scooby-Doo and tell your wife it's research, but it's research. And watch how Felma interacts with people. The answer is she doesn't because Felma solves all the incidents, but actually she's a lone worker. She gets other people to do things, but she comes in, has the zowie moment and tells everybody like, oh, this is what we need to do. That's cool but she shared nothing, okay? Personally, I think the best people, Shaggy and Scooby. They work as a team, they work well with management, they'll do what they need to, and they'll give it their best. And if you've got lots of Shaggies and Scoobies, because they're also fun to be with, then actually you can train that, you can develop that, and you can get yourself a good team. A team full of Velmas actually is a team full of isolationists, loners who hoard information. And that means the APT guys will win because you have an OODA loop that doesn't actually go all the way around. Thank you very much.